Nine years ago, when they disappeared in 2011, Alessia and Livia Shep were six years old. That means that they would be 15 today. Teenagers starting high school and thinking about all the things that teenagers think about. Instead, today we're going to talk about how they disappeared and how their father robbed them of the normal life that they should have had. From what I can tell, this case was really big in Europe, but in the US I had not really heard about it and everything that I read about it originally in English basically said the same thing and just included a very small number of facts until I started going through the French sources and translating the French sources and I only have one semester of French so I had some help with the translation using various translating apps which thankfully are a lot better than they used to be. And so let's get down to the story because these two girls could still be out there and that is one of the reasons that their story is so important. You can't talk about the disappearance of Alessia and Livia Shep without first talking about the relationship of their parents. And there's going to be a lot of different names of different cities in here, in different countries. If I mangle anything, please feel free to correct me in the comments. I'm definitely doing my best. I looked up a lot of names and the pronunciations, but there are a lot of names in here and so I'm bound to get some wrong. Matthias and Irina met in 2003. She was from the March region of Ascoli Pacino, and she worked as a lawyer in Lausanne for Philip Morris, the tobacco company. He was an engineer for the same company. Though he was originally from Canada, he was now a Swiss resident. They met in the mountains on one of those weekends that's organized by large employers for employees to meet each other. Irina remembers him as being tall and sporty and blonde. He was kind and considerate. The first time that she met him, she said she remembers him making her laugh all weekend long. Matthias began to court her. At first, Irina wasn't really in love, just slightly. After a year, she found out that she was pregnant with twins. At first, Matthias was frightened, but then he accepted the pregnancy, and so they moved in together in San Sulpice. On October 7th, 2004, the twins were born. They named them Alessia Vera Shep and Livia Clara Shep. In the beginning, things were good. But then, the doubts began to creep in for Irina. There were moments when Matea seemed completely devoid of compassion. After giving birth, Irina developed septicemia and her life was in danger. Still, even when she was so sick, he showed up with friends and even with groups of complete strangers to show them the babies. He kept saying to everyone, this is my wife, without ever even mentioning her name. Later, she would say that she should have left him then that she should have known that he could never love her without really seeing her. As time went on, his personality became more and more controlling and disturbing. Everything had to go strictly according to his authoritarian plans. His yellow post-it notes with schedules were everywhere. Orders were given and plans were set for the most insignificant of things. Everything the girls did had to be regulated. How the fridge was opened, eating, playing. Every act of life had to be set according to a certain pattern. When he came home in the evening, he ruled over everything. Dinner had to be strictly at seven o'clock. Then they would wash and put on their pajamas. After that, they would watch TV and go up to the bedroom, tell the girls a story, and at nine, the lights had to be off. This could be a normal night, but the problem was that he would become incredibly upset if anyone wanted to change this scenario. It had to be like this, exactly like this. Little by little, the relationship began to crumble under the stress of Matthias's emotional abuse and authoritarian rule. Irina asked her husband to attend therapy. He agreed, but then said he would only do it if the therapist could be German. They went to therapy, but no progress was made. And so when the girls were five years old, Irina requested a separation. He was opposed. Irina insisted. And so Matthias moved into an apartment near the girls' school, but he constantly sent Irina messages asking her to reconcile. In December of 2010, Irina files for divorce. She sends him a final email on January 26th, 2011. She tells him, that the divorce documents are ready. Now, you have to understand that it's not as if during this time, Matthias doesn't get to see the girls. He gets to see them on weekends. For three weeks over the holidays, he gets to take them to the Caribbean. 
Irina wants her children to have a relationship with their father, but it seems that for him this is not enough. On the last week of January 2011, Alessia and Livia are set to spend the weekend with their father. He picks the girls up on Friday, January 28th. The girls are wearing blue jeans. Alessia is wearing a white jacket over a striped shirt. Livia is dressed in a purple ski jacket over a green t-shirt. At first, everything seems normal. The girls are just spending a weekend with their dad. Then on Sunday, Irina gets a phone call. Matias offers to take the girls to school on Monday morning. He says that the girls are fine, that they're playing at a friend's house, and that she shouldn't worry. What Irina doesn't know is that all of this is a lie. Phone records will later show that Matias is already headed south for France. She tells him no, that she'd like to see the girls before they go to school, and to bring them home as he usually does. He doesn't respond right away. Finally, Matias sends a text in which he reassures her, but he is already in Annecy, having passed the border of France 17 minutes earlier. He already knows that he has no intention of bringing the girls home. When Matias arrives at Leon at 7.30, he turns off his cell phone. Irina feels that something is wrong and she rushes to his house. It's empty. She rushes to the police station and she warns the police. A massive manhunt begins. But even while they had begun looking for the girls, one of the police officers said to Irina, don't worry, your husband will come back with the children. He's Swiss. Now, I guess that the police officer would say that because the Swiss, when I googled it to see what the crime rate was, have the lowest crime rate, according to Google, in the world. But still, there is a small amount of crime there. But they did begin looking for the children right away from everything that I could find. On the 1st of February, Matthias bought a ferry ticket for three people bound for Corsica. The ticket was for a ferry bound for Propriano, for a ferry that was leaving from Marseille. In Marseille, Matthias would really begin to show his hand. He would send his wife a postcard. This postcard was a picture of a rabbit on a green meadow. On it were written the words, it is too late now. Matthias would also begin to withdraw large amounts of money from ATMs around the city center, amounting to around 7,500 euros. On the card, he would also tell his wife that he could not live without her. Various places online say that this, Corsica, is said to be significant to Matthias and Irina because it is rumored that this is where the girls were conceived. Many, many places online will say that it is never confirmed that the girls were on the ferry. However, Three witnesses in the next cabin over are certain that they saw the twins. Another witness confirms that they were playing in the play area, and the commissioner of the boat gave testimony also that they were on board. However, several witnesses also say that Matthias disembarked alone or with a blonde woman and that the girls were nowhere in sight. Now, according to police, there really isn't proof that the girls ever made it to Corsica. However, there are witnesses that said that they saw them there. One local woman from Propriano said that strangers are spotted immediately, especially this time of year. She says that Matias and the girls were talking to a brown-haired woman. Some reports say that she said a blonde-haired woman about, it was about 50-50 in the reports that I saw, who was wearing a three-quarter length coat and white trousers. She wasn't from Propriano or I would have recognized her. Now, the part that really interested me was that she said the girls were wearing pink tracksuits and parkas. She said that they were eating croissants or chocolate pastries. She said one had glasses on and a pink and white hat. Now, the most interesting part of this for me is that Arena confirms that that was an outfit that the girls had. And I've seen so many pictures of the girls and I have never seen that outfit. So I was wondering how the woman could have known that that was an outfit that they had unless she'd really seen them, which to me kind of puts them on the island. Another person who is quite certain that he saw them on the island is Jacques Corsini, who runs a service station in Travel Corsica. He is certain he saw the father and twins on February 1st. Corsini said he had on a light sweater on his shoulders and was there in the middle of the day when it wasn't busy between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. He's certain he remembers both the car that he was driving and the twin girls. The police have not been interested in his story. He also said, no, a lonely man like that one day in February with two young girls. No, I cannot be wrong. He initially thought that they were Italian tourists and asked if they were on vacation. And the man replied in French with a very strong accent, no, I'm Swiss. He said then a little blonde girl came in wearing glasses and took a lollipop 
and the father asked if her sister was still in the car and told him and told her to grab something for her sister too. He said that the man just paid in cash and seemed very relaxed and calm. That by the time he had called the police, that the service station camera had already written over itself. After leaving Propriano, Matias arrives in Bastia and then embarks for Toulon. On February 2nd, he enters Italy in Bentimiglia. Matias is last seen in Naples, Italy on February 3rd. He goes to eat lunch at a small pizzeria, where the pizzeria owner describes him as jovial. In Naples, he sends Arena several letters, along with 8,000 euros. In one of the letters that he sends Arena, he writes to her, the girls are resting in peace. They have not suffered. You will not see them again. Late at night, at 11.45, he goes to the Saragnola rail railway station and he throws himself in front of a train. And I'm going to show you what it looks like here, but the Saragnola railway station is not at all what I pictured. For some reason when I pictured it, I think I pictured a busy city railway station and what it actually looks like is a railway station in probably a smaller town or just a railway station that's kind of off by itself, which I guess makes sense, but I think what I pictured was something that he would have fallen down out of and not had a chance to get up from, as opposed to something that was completely level with the trains that he would just step out, have stepped out in front of, which was apparently what it was like, as you can see at this particular railway station where he chose to end his life, leaving behind no clues really that anyone could find as to where the girls were and whether or not they were still alive. On February 4th, Arena goes to the police station in Marseille in search of her children, because at this point she has that postcard from Marseille, so that's the last place she's known them to be. On February 5th, the little girl's uncle claims that the little girls were last seen in Monza in northern Italy in the company of a woman with brown hair. This ends up being a dead end. On the 6th, the police find Matthias's will. Interpol launches an alert to all 188 member countries. The international search operation is given a name on the 7th of February, Operation Jamel. In English, that means Operation Twins. On the 9th of February, the Marseille prosecutor announces that the twins were on the ferry to Corsica. Arena makes a public plea for witnesses to come forward. Now this is interesting because later on the police will go back and forth on whether or not they actually were on the ferry. The next day the police are searching for Matthias's tape recorder which was always with him because it was not found on his body. The police also discover that two days before he took off with the girls, Matthias was researching methods of poisoning and suicide on the internet. He was also looking at weapons. While all of this is going on, Arena can't wait for the police to do the work on their own. She gets bank and telephone records. She goes to the pharmacy to find out if he bought deadly drugs or sleeping pills. In Marseille, she questions hotel owners and boat companies. In Corsica, she flies over the island with police and she points out to them the places that she went on holiday with him and with the girls to aid in their search. At the end of February, she finally is given the keys to Matias's villa and she is able to search the rooms one by one. She searches the trash, which the investigators had neglected to do. She finds a crumpled post-it note that says, delete Facebook. His suitcases are gone. There are muddy boots that she knows that he never wore. Neighbors tell her that he wore them the day that he disappeared. In his will, he gave no indication of his plans. He left a house for Arena, other property for a few relatives, but most would go to the girls. But there was one last bone-chilling exception in his will. He had written, In case my children, Alessia and Livia, should no longer be alive, my brother Daniel and my sister Maya are the main heirs in equal share. There were traces of saliva that were found in the trunk of his car at the train station. The police were hopeful that this saliva would yield some clues. Whether there was poison or sleeping pills in the system of whichever girl's saliva it was, however the amount was too small, and they couldn't rule out that the saliva had come through indirect contact, meaning that hopefully the girls hadn't been in the trunk of that car. Then a spokesman for the VOD police announced, the presence of the girls on the boat is attested by witnesses, but these are testimonies and not a certainty. By summer, 
the hope in Switzerland of finding the girls alive had become tiny. One man came forward saying he saw a man dragging a large suitcase on the beach in saint Pre. According to one official, the police communication to all civil protection was now clear. From now on, you are no longer looking for living bodies, but for corpses. And yet still there were sightings of twins who looked like the girls. A waitress in Termoli in central Italy saw two girls who she believed were the twins walking with a Roma couple. She called her boss over. He looked at the children and he also believed that they were the twins. The two called the police and the police rushed to the scene, but by the time they arrived, the girls, whoever they were, were long gone. On the 250th day after the girl's disappearance, their mother announced the creation of a foundation for missing children. Missing Children Switzerland is based in San Silvis near her home. As she makes the announcement, the girls should now be seven. They should be home with their mother. Instead, she finds herself speaking to the press. And updating the press on the investigation which is being conducted in parallel by the French, Italian, and Swiss police. Two years after the investigation, Irina has left her job as an attorney. She no longer lives in the home that she shared with her two daughters. For a time, she traveled in Asia. She stayed in Indonesia, in Hong Kong, in India, living and teaching. In an interview, she said, looking at the kids, I would think about Matthias and how stupid he was. He was rich in the richest country in the world. He had everything and he threw it away for no reason. Sightings continue here and there. They're usually confirmed later to be other blonde girls that resemble the twins. In September 2013, there is a claim that the police take seriously. A lawyer in Cagliari is told by a client in Buon Camino prison that he overheard some Romani detainees talking about twins who arrived from Corsica who were being held in a nomad camp between Orstiano and Macomer in June. There have been other sightings in Orst Oristano. The lawyer says his client wants to remain anonymous because he's worried about it retaliation. The Cagliari judiciary opens a file and it's turned over, over to the deputy prosecutor. They are told exactly where the girls supposedly are and exactly who has them. At dawn on September 25th, the Blitz of the Carabinieri Ross took place of the Barra Plateau near Macomer, but the twins are not there. And the matriarch of the Roma community, Vera Milanovic, with 15 children and 27 grandchildren says, we have been living in Macomer for 21 years. Our children were born and raised here. Our hearts really cry for those two girls, but we have nothing to do with it. The police search other Roma camps as well, but the girls are nowhere to be found. The latest news about the girls comes in 2014 when someone who works for a print shop reaches out to an Italian journalist, Ercole Rochetti, a reporter with a television show focused on missing persons, Chila Havisto, who saw it. The letter sent from Barry claims that the shop, which usually makes fake passports for immigrants and Eastern girls, it says that one of the girls is living in Ottawa and the other is living in Quebec, in a town near the Ontario-Quebec border. The shoot. When this letter comes in, Rochetti went to Canada with his program and searched for the girls. But when police in Ottawa were asked about the situation, they said that it was news to them, but that if they were asked to assist by the Italian police, they would. And that is where the trail goes cold. Let's talk about the theories of what happened to the girls. The first theory is that Matthias murdered his daughters, either in Switzerland, some believe he murdered them before he crossed the border near Lake Geneva. And the reason for this is because there were some hours in the afternoon that were unaccounted for when his phone was near Lake Geneva and that would also account for the mud on his boots and for him wearing the boots that he usually didn't wear. But I find this unlikely just because there were so many sightings of the girls. There was that woman who saw them in outfits, the captain, all the people in the cabin next to them, in the play area. There were just far too many sightings of the girls in Corsica and on the ferry for me to believe that he killed them when they were still in Switzerland. I think that if he did kill them, that it happened after he got to Corsica. I think that if he did murder them, that it happened on Corsica and that that's why there's all these witnesses up until the point where they get to Corsica and then once they're in Corsica, they disappeared. If this first theory, 
the murder theory is right, that he probably did it at some place that was special to them, at one of the places that they'd visited as a family. For people who don't know, Corsica isn't a small island that can be thoroughly searched. It is a huge island. It's not like they can search every nook and cranny and find it, as some people have suggested in various places online that I've seen. The murder theory correct, which I sincerely hope it is not, that would be my guess for where their bodies are resting. But honestly, I hope that it's one of the other theories. The second theory that's frequently mentioned is that someone took the girls and took them overseas to Canada as was mentioned in that letter to the reporter. Oftentimes the brown haired or blonde haired lady, depending on the source you listen to, is mentioned in this scenario. In this scenario, hopefully the girls are being cared for somewhere in Canada. When I first heard this theory, my first thought was that it seemed unlikely just because they're so noticeable and because it seems like it was a big story in Canada and in Europe. They're just so blonde and so cute and it seemed like if you saw them, it seemed like they would be very hard to hide. But with the addition of the news and the claim that they were hidden separately, it seems like that would make them easier to hide if they were separated, living separate lives. So if that's the case, maybe that does make the idea more possible if they were in separate provinces and if they were kept away from each other. I think this is probably the nicest theory, even though none of them are really nice. I mean, they're all awful. The story is heartbreaking. I hope that they're alive and being cared for somewhere and that someday they're found and brought back to their mother. The final theory is that they're in a Roma camp, like the ones that were searched and they were just moved in time or they were in a different camp or something like that. I think that's only because they have been spotted, but that could just be other kids that look somewhat like them from a distance and I think that that's probably the least likely of the three theories, to be honest. I would really like to believe that Matthias really just wanted his wife to believe that they were dead to hurt her, but that he actually sent them away. But my fear is that he actually did this evil thing and that he actually killed his two beautiful daughters in order to hurt his wife for leaving him. And that is why this is such a devastating story. What do you think? Which theory do you think is the most likely? I find myself hoping for the second, but thinking that the first is more likely after all this time. If you have any suggestions for cases, especially cases that you don't hear of very often on YouTube, I would love to hear them in the comment section. And that is it for today. If you love to listen to true crime on YouTube, I would love it if you'd hit subscribe and I will see you next week. Bye.